Welcome back, and I'm doing my live show from the beautiful downtown Portland, uh, Riverside. And uh, we have the amazing Professor James McKenney with a major update. In fact, uh, if you go to his website, jmccsdi.com, jmccsdi.com, uh, Professor McKenney's got a major update on what's going on in terms of space weather and a major announcement. And uh, there's some strange things going on with the sun. So, Professor McKenney, tell us what's happening. Are they using proper measurement tools? Uh, the regular level of what we call science like NASA is for the public. And, of course, we've talked about this before, Tier 1 science. So what's happening? Uh, yeah, Dr. Bill, uh, here's the situation. In about uh, the late 1900 or the late 1990s, NASA was given an edict, kind of a scientific goal, and that was to me measure the solar output. Uh, in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from microwave to infrared, all the way up into the ultraviolet. So they designed and put up some satellites, and, of course, in typical NASA fashion, they assumed the answers in building their spacecraft. They did, the design of the spacecraft was meant to look at long-term changes. Uh, and uh, from what I know from my research and what uh, and many times I've tried to tell them directly, that the solar output is variable on a almost hourly, sometimes minute-to-minute -minute basis. And it can vary wildly and that the surface fusion, uh, the, the fusion of the sun is at the surface of the sun. And uh, so as a result, um, it can change very uh, dramatically from high to low. And so their instrumentation on their satellite was completely misdesigned for what it had to measure. They assumed that the changes in solar output would be over decades or hundreds of years or thousands of years when the real changes are in the middle of the spectrum, it could be a certain small region of the spectrum, which is all of a sudden exploding in brightness. Uh, and uh, so what they did is they measured the average and then took the sampling over very long periods of time. And so around 2007, they started to look at shorter samplings and discovered that the, the sun sometimes has thousands of times more output, especially in certain bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, than what the average is. And this might last for an hour, and then it goes away. And so then they, in around 2007, they stopped reporting they stopped modeling. They, they went off into what they call modeling land, where they try and model what's going on. And, of course, their, their models could not conceivably approach what's really happening because they believe that the fusion of the sun is deep in the core of the sun, and therefore the energy has to migrate outwards. And so they're still going on this basically 1600s view of the sun being a hot ball a hot blowing ball, which it isn't. It, it just cannot possibly work that way. One time I was at a conference, an American Geophysical Union conference, and an engineer came up to me who was not part of the conference. And he says, uh, I know who you are, and uh, I need somebody I can talk to about this problem with the sun. And I thought, well, okay, I'll listen to the guy. And he says, look, I'll show you my calculations. He said, if you take the mass of the sun and you convert it using E equals mc squared into the amount of light energy that the whole sun could put off of it over uh, four and a half billion years, given that it's burning at a constant rate, the same constant rate we have today, he said there's not enough matter in the entire sun to power the sun for four and a half billion years at the rate which it's putting out energy now and converting it to mass. He said that doesn't include the solar wind, which is throwing out protons, primarily protons, uh, in the solar wind at a constant rate uh, or at an assumed constant rate. And he said uh, the sun doesn't have enough mass to do this, what they're saying it does. Uh, and so I told him, I said, well, yeah, there's some problems here, and, and I've shown that the surface, the fusion of the sun is at the surface. And so there's not enough hydrogen in the surface of the sun to maintain this level of heat. 
over that length of time, so there must be a renewal process going on. And uh, so anyway, we talked for a while. Uh, so anyway, here's NASA up there with a satellite from 2003 to 2007 making measurements, believing that the energy is coming from the core of the sun. It has a long-term average. And what they're looking for ultimately is climate change over, right. you know, 10 or 50 years expecting a minimal, minimal change in solar output that would affect climate. And all of a sudden they wake up in 2007 and realize that the sun is putting out sometimes thousands of times more energy in a certain wavelength than it normally does. And they go, "Uh uh-oh, we don't know anything. We can't explain this. We don't know anything about what's going on. Our instrumentation is totally incorrect. So they hibernate into never-never land. Uh, So... (laughs) And fast forward to 2013, my announcement is basically stating that, um, and and, uh, I had a a fan call me last week, and he says, Jim, I just got to tell you this, because you made this comment about the sun variability on your show last week. And he said, uh, some people out in San Diego have a water slide, one of these things you spray water on for the kids, and they always put it in the same place in their yard. Uh, and the kids slide down the water s- slide, and they then they roll it up and put it away. Well, that day, when they rolled up the water slide, all the grass was black. And they thought, good grief, what's, what's going on here? And so then uh, he started attributing many other s- factors that uh, the sun, regarding the sun, very strange things. And he says, look, I don't know, but, you, you, you know, start talking more about this. And so, yeah, it, it, uh, well, the effect of the ultraviolet light, I had a botanist, and I was doing marine bacteriology 40 years ago, well before I went into medicine, and he discovered that a 75% drop in the ozone layer could cause a destruction of the upper 30 feet or 10 meters of the benthic layer of the oceans, which makes 80% of the world's oxygen, would kill all the grassy plants and would kill all the trees, the fruiting trees in bloom. So you only, you only need a 75% drop and a UV shift. So we're seeing now UV rates. If you look at the UV chart over North America, through Mexico, Central America, and I'm sure it's elsewhere around the world, the ultraviolet light levels are at unprecedented levels. These are actually public details. This is not a conspiracy theory. It's public published printed charts to tell you you're seeing levels of 11, 12, 13, 14, Mexico City 16. Never seen before. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona 13, 14. Typically, even in the spring, and now that we're getting into a few days towards summer, we're seeing ridiculously high levels. And when you go outside, you can tell the sun feels different. Even if it's not brighter on that day, the sun feels different on your skin. It just feels like there's there's a pressure on your skin. It feels right. uh, like you're uh, like you know when you go to the tanning booth, the old <laughs> the old tanning booth. Where they just right. blasted, you know, it, it, you get out and you of uh, the sun and you feel yeah, like that. But the other well, thing is, was, this is not Dan going Dale away. Yes, this, Dan Dale this is a month ago. There were two bands that have been around since 1992, and in the C and D light, A will tan you with ultra bronzer tanning machines. B will burn you. C will give you cancer, and D, which could cause DNA damage, uh, and adox, and also will photoactivate drugs, chemicals, and even biological molecules or toxins in your body. Skin, and D will kill you. So we're seeing two new bands in the C and D band area, and what you're saying is the ultraviolet light rating, this is public knowledge, has gone into orbit. It's really, really high now. Yeah, so people, uh, uh, first of all, people have to be very careful, have to wear um, uh, sunscreen or, or long sleeve shirts and uh, headgear, uh, but that sounds like we're heading into a break. I think we are. We will be back in just a minute with the amazing Professor McCanny. We're going to post up the chart. Go to his website, kmcpsci.com. We'll be back. And Professor David McCanny, the website is jmccsci.com. We have a new book on comets, 
Uh, usually you're on at least once or twice a month, uh, Professor McKinney. Uh, I posted up the EPA website for those people who are a little skeptical. If you look at the UV index, the actual chart for today, June, June 18th, it's uh, really pretty crazy, pretty ridiculous. Uh, and, of course, they're only measuring part of the spectrum. They're not saying, they're not giving a breakdown of the of the amount of energy in the A spectra, B, A, A is can, B is burns, D is cancer, D is death. They don't do that. And, but we know the overall index is, is really, really unusually high. It's an index to 10, and you're in Southern California or Arizona and you're 12, and if you're in Mexico City, you're 16, that's dangerous. It causes pterygians of the eye. It suppresses your immune system. It can cause skin cancer death, and it can also penetrate deeper into other organs. It can photoactivate drugs you're taking, which are called photoactivatable medications. They can change uh, not only vitamins, but can also cause degradation of nutrients in your body. So it, it's a stressor, and there's a lot of things that stress this plants. Some plants can adapt to it. Uh, those that can, uh, it can stunt their growth or actually cause a famine. So uh, if there's a major shift in the ultraviolet light, either due to one or more factors, like decrease, decrease in magnetosphere because you're going to have a magnetic shift, decrease in oxygen in the upper atmosphere, or decrease in ultraviolet light in space, which is not happening. We have plenty of ultraviolet light. We right now still have plenty of oxygen, so my guess is there's going to be something happening with the magnetosphere that's allowing this or uh, just a shift in the actual energy from the sun, which is even more probable. The sun is just generating more of these kind of energies, and they just haven't pursued the science accurately because they have a priori assumption that the sun always produces a constant amount of certain energy, almost like, you know, a rheostat on your air conditioning machine uh, or your heater. It doesn't do that. It varies on all kinds of variables. Yeah, that, that's the thing the, the scientists assumed, and I was just rereading here on the break, uh, the, it's called source, uh, solar, uh, uh, let me, let me pull that up. Um, it's called the, uh, let me pull this up just a second. Solar radiation and climate experiment. This is a satellite that was launched in 2003, and, uh, the, the assumption is that uh, the sun would change over long periods of time, and so they're talking about a 0.1% change over the solar cycle of 11 years. This is what they're trying to measure. Then all of a sudden, in 2007, they start looking at some of this finer data, the more uh, radiation-specific, and they realized that, like I say, 1,000 times more energetic within uh, just a couple hours. So they're totally baffled. Uh, so uh, the other thing is I believe that the military, the tier, what I call Tier 1 science, is fully aware of this. They let these buffoons go on for years, obviously, with incorrect science and not telling the public. And then when the stark reality comes that everything they've been doing is incorrect and ridiculous, they go into hiding, they keep their funding, they keep their project going, but but the real loser here is the public. Uh, because right. uh, we're talking about serious health issues. Well, and NASA been... does not have the ability to tell you uh, it's it's interesting that they publish these UV health reports on a daily basis, but you're not hearing that on the evening news either. No. If you just look at their chart, though, at the bottom it says WHO, the exposure levels. And you can see if your level is extreme or over 11, which it is in Southern California, Southern uh, Arizona, and New Mexico, it's in there also in Southern Nevada, it's there in Southern Texas, it says that, 10 minutes the sun will cause significant skin damage. That's right there in their own data, right in their own chart. 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, 10 minutes in the sun. And uh, we, the other thing is we don't know what's going on with the rest of the sun. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's very complicated because UV light does not necessarily cause heat. In so what, what, what our climate for, system and our weather system, other more visible, uh, the infrared, much of that is blacked out, and uh, so a lot of the visible light is what creates heat. Uh, we're actually very cool. Uh, a lot of the northern states are having problems with crops this year because of cool, wet ground. 
the soybean crop in the upper Midwest, is, as far as I can tell, is almost lost already. Uh, corn requires a 105-day growing season of greater than 70-degree temperatures day and night, uh, and especially critical in when the young corn is growing in that. Well, I mean, there's no way we've had that. I mean, we're still experiencing 50-degree nights in uh, yeah. late in June. So, uh, you know, this is having more ramifications than just walking out in the sun. But the end result is that nobody in the scientific community who's been given this, uh, this charter, none of them can give us any details of what is really going on with the sun. Uh, there, there's a decade and a half of research. Uh, what they've been looking at is long-term data, thinking about climate change, which is is uh, once again let's let's look at the concept of climate change. If the sun is radically changing on an hourly basis, what does climate change over a 50-year period mean? It's it's absurd. It's beyond absurd. Uh, that, that they're even talking about climate change because it, it you know, the, the sun is directly powering our earth on a minute to minute basis. So, uh, you know, the, the level of absurdity on all of these counts continues. And then, well, uh, you talked about another thing, Dr. Bill, about the oxygen level, something that's really hidden from the public also is the fact that. In the, the burning coal, burning the automobiles, burning oil, and all the other sources of energy that we're using, uh, we're burning up oxygen at a tremendous rate. Uh, exactly. And exactly. The, uh, we're, I the, we're the only ones that I know that talk about this, of what a, a problem which will happen probably this century, we call peak oxygen. Not peak CO2 or peak oil. Peak oxygen where the consumption gets so fast the ability of the earth, the lungs of the earth, the benthic layer of the oceans and the trees and plants to recycle that CO2 back into oxygen is limited. And now the actual oxygen level of the planet drops, especially in the upper atmosphere. So your UV protection is gone, and it starts to affect living things down the surface of the earth because the actual total oxygen. In some big cities like Sao Paulo, Brazil, it's been measured that the oxygen level in the center of Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Brazil, is as low as 11 12%. Which basically causes a hypoxic frontal lobotomy. So some of the behaviors you're going to start seeing of human beings is basically like putting people up at 10,000 feet, where their brain basically acts like there's not enough oxygen. Yeah, and you you actually can see that too. The, um, I am just uh, somewhat amazed as I look around the United States, even. Uh, people are walking around like zombies. I think part of that is due to the fluoride in the water, the effect of fluoride. Right. But, uh, the lack of oxygen is a real issue. Peak oxygen. And they're not telling you about it, but it's probably one of the major factors besides the change in the sun activity. As we head into a slow, called bonder type ice age, the, the spectral pattern of the sun is increasingly dangerous to crop. As I mentioned, uh, my theory, and again, it's one it's only my theory that I just wanted to cross-check with you on this, is that there's a, a probable long cycle pattern where there's a shift in spectral pattern of the sunlight, so there's decrease in infrared and visible light, increase in ultraviolet light that occurs over cycles, and we're heading into a moderate minimum uh, cooling period that happens every 360 years, estimated to last until about 2070. Uh, with the increased ultraviolet light, with the drop in oxygen worldwide, with the expansion of the industry in Indonesia, China, and India, we're consuming oxygen. We're also poisoning and killing the upper benthic layer of the oceans. There's over 10,000 dead zones. Now we have a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico as well, which is why we have these giant jellyfish from uh, Australia. They're actually migrating into the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> so what's happening, we're getting a spread of hypoxia, it's going to decrease the ability of the ozone layer to protect us. It's not due to chlorofluorocarbons. They're what I call a brick in a pool. You put a brick up there in the upper atmosphere, it's not going to stay there. It can't stay there. Even if you spray it out of the space station, it'll fall to the ground. What's happening is there's only three things that generate ozone, ultraviolet light, the magnetic 
field of the earth itself, the flux field, and uh, the uh, ultra and the presence of oxygen. And so, no one's talking about these issues, are they? Except us. We're the only ones that I know actually publicly talk about the fact we have policies in place where we have to move to tokamak fusion reactors, energy from a vacuum, other technology, uh, geothermal, etc. Because even abiotic fuel, which is not which is massive. Uh, I've heard a report that if you just burn the tar pits uh, and the sources of oil just in Venezuela, the oxygen concentration of the world would be burned in a matter of, say, three months. The oxygen concentration yeah, that's a, of the would drop into that's a That's a calculation I did a number of years ago. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and, and what and, and, and how, over what period of time would that have to happen because of that level of destruction? Well, it, if... Uh, it just depends on the rate of uh, burning, but um, uh, if you if you took that oil and over a 10-year period burned just a portion of it, you would consume all the oxygen in the in the world. So uh, the other point is that that points out that that oil could not possibly be fossil fuel. It couldn't not possibly be the result of fern forest because. If that oil were created, then there would have to be a proportionate amount of oxygen to uh, commensurate with that amount of oil. So the oil couldn't possibly have been from decaying fern forests. It had to right. come from somewhere else, and that other location is outer space from passing comets. Right. I mean, but the, so, um, no, we, we want to talk about the Ison comet that's coming this October, November, and also. Uh, there's there's several individuals out there that are making false statements about quote Planet X. We want to talk about the real danger of nearer space objects. The issue of a quote the Planet X issue. Uh, can we get into these now? What, what about ISON? This one is a, there's a lot of mixed messages coming from NASA saying it's going to be the comet of the century, but yet it's only it's what's actually quite a bit smaller even than the Halley's comet. What's the story there? What's happening? Uh, yeah, that was another posting I put on my page is that NASA has not presented uh, data that would suggest this is going to be a huge comet. And uh, the the biggest thing they lie about are the nuclei of comets. And uh, depending on who you listen to, the Naval Observatory or the the other sources, this there. But they're now they're kind of settling on the concept that this nucleus is two kilometers across. They said that Comet Lovejoy was 600 meters across, or uh, 200 meters, 600 feet across, which is totally absurd. Uh, that this uh, comet that went through the sun came out the other side and nucleus was visible from Earth with the naked eye, and they're saying it was 600 feet across. Um, really comet Halley's nucleus is was directly measured, close-up data, as being seven kilometers across. Uh, in that this comet Halley is, is a little teeny comet. Uh, they were saying that comet Hillbop had a 42-kilometer nucleus, and it was kind of a mid- to medium-sized comet. It was okay big, but it wasn't super big, according to historical standards. But they're claiming this comet is going to match the comet of 1680 or bigger, which was not near Earth, it, it, but it was gigantic. It filled up the whole sky. And they're saying that this comet with a two-kilometer nucleus is going to do more. So NASA can't get its story straight. They have not presented any real data that's going to suggest that this comet is going to be big. So we have two things to two two ways to look at this. One is that they're lying, and the second one is that they're lying. <laughs> so, uh, there's, there's no there's no way that their story adds up. So why does NASA have a special team headed by some physicist uh, from Goddard Space Flight Center? Why do they have a special team that's being put together to uh, to filter information to the public? Uh, why are they promoting this and saying it's going to be November when this starts? when the first activity is this comet will be passing by Mars in mid-September, uh, months yeah. earlier. Uh, why right. is NASA ignoring this? Uh, everything they're doing is slip, slide, lie, uh, misinformation, and none of it adds up. 
So, uh, you know, what are, what are they? Uh, all I can say is that uh, I suspect this is going to be a big comet. I suspect it's going to have a, it, it has a nucleus that's fairly large. And uh, clearly NASA knows something they're not telling the public. Now, does that mean, again, the Pier 1 future science, could this be, and again, let's try a bit, uh, the prophetic uh, Hopi prophecy of the Blue Kachina? Uh, no, and there again, um, the uh, the Blue Kachina is uh, uh, related to other big comets. Um, and I've always said to people, and I know these these stories are floating around the Internet, but right. uh, you have to consider the source. The, it's the same group of people that said the Earth was going to end on December 21st, 2012. They should have been exactly. uh, yeah, the, off in the basement is. playing with something, uh, uh, you know, uh, right. take their brains out and play with them. Now they're all washed up. But this is the same group of people. So uh, there's right. a, they're kind of a, a cluster of people that put out, uh, you know, every comet is Planet X. Uh, yeah, in other words, it's a form of the Earth. Instead of it, in other words, science-based uh, analysis of danger of space weather near space objects that can have a number of events over a period of many years, but it's in the form of, in the sense of uh, space weather apocalyptic pornography. Oh, yeah, that's a good term. That's a good term. Uh, and they, what they do is they listen to my show, they listen to your show. And then they pick up buzzwords, um, and uh, of course I've been talking about spectral analysis lately. So now they can use spectral analysis as a term. They don't know what a spectrum is. They wouldn't know how to read one if they if it hit them over the head. But uh, you know, and then they're sending this information out. So yeah, there's some real Looney Tunes out there. Yeah. Uh, no. the, and uh, what I figured out, Dr. Bill, because, uh, uh, of course, I'm one of the main targets that they're borrowing material from, the Shelton Days, the John DiNardos, the, the, uh, um, the U, uh, Yao USA, Marshall Masters, Clowns, you know, all these people, uh, they, what they, they, they're, the main motivation is very hard to imagine because, uh, but what I've determined is that these people uh, some time ago have become under some kind of either mind control, somebody slipping a money under the table and uh, for support to make them think they're important. There's all kinds of ways to get these people to continue doing ridiculous things. Yeah, and then uh, things that are really dangerous, like the uh, case in the El Paso, like you could destroy crops. We don't have any to do with it. The same way we don't deal with Fukushima Daiichi, that's a real disaster. Amazing. Yeah. Back and forth with more with Chris McKinney. You can call in 800 257 Welcome back, and uh, Professor McCanny, uh you mentioned uh, a couple of things. There's a lot of disinformation out there about the planet X. We've talked about the fact that there are a number of wandering planets through the uh, galaxy, probably as many as 100 million wandering planets or large objects. Some of them are uh, uh, red or, or brown dwarf stars. The red dwarf stars, of course, have very powerful magnetic fields. They can be detected from even those dwarf clouds. Uh, some of these objects can pass through the Oort cloud and, and push comets in that can take decades or even centuries to, to come in. Um, uh, space weather, basically, is a really big deal. The problem is that the Tier 1 science is hiding this. I know when I had security clearance as a civilian doctor in the mid-'90s, uh, they exposed us to a lot of information to tell us that they bifurcated science. And this doesn't just happen recently. This goes back to the ancient priesthood of the ancient world, it's in the modern universities now, it's in these secret agencies where even tenured professors never get access to the information because it's a need-to-know basis. And unless they induct you or bring you into a specific program that's highly compartmentalized, you have no idea what is happening in another compartment or another division of the same agency. And this is particularly dangerous when you're dealing with space weather, earth changes, 
solar activity and other things that could literally crash our civilization because it's so fragile. Uh, yeah, exactly. And um, uh, I was at a scientific conference one time. They were discussing solar wind and solar wind modeling. And the scientist giving the discussion at the at the meeting uh, said, "When we always send our data up to the military level, the scientist, tier one scientist, basically, he doesn't use that term." Uh, but, uh, and then at the end, somebody asked him, he says, well, what did they respond to you about your modeling and your data? And he said, oh, they never respond. We don't know if it was good or bad or if they used it or if anything. And that's, that to me was very exactly the guy who was saying exactly the situation. Right, and, unprofessional. Uh, there's, also, uh, there's science up there that they don't know about, they will never know about. Uh, if they're doing good or bad or indifferent, in they have no idea. Yeah, and it's, it, under the, the uh, Obama administration, the process that started back many years ago has gone completely black out. So now we have organizations like the Dragon and uh, under Edwin Musk, who owns uh, PayPal, are one of the primary and the Virgin Atlantic, now Virgin uh, uh, Space Vehicles. These private corporations now, and also the Black Ops Project, have completely taken over space exploration and, uh, and science. I think it's very bad for civilization, and it's very bad for the safety of the people on Earth not to know these facts and not to uh, understand what's happening to our planet. Uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. These people have uh, made big money uh, and then reinvested in space, and it's like they're these great entrepreneurs. Uh, right. right now, behind the scenes, they are analyzing asteroids using NASA data, but these people are putting their eyes on mining asteroids with private funding, and but using the information gained from NASA to identify which asteroids have the good stuff, the good deposits, that they can go out there and overnight change the economy of the entire world with a single find in an asteroid of gold or platinum or other precious metals. And, uh, and this is all being done through these cozy little deals, like you say, Musk and, and the other people um, that uh, gained their money, and what did they do when they sold their enterprises, their, their YouTubes or their Googles or their Facebook or whatever they sold, uh, the government ends up owning them and then spying on the public using those tools. What a cozy deal. Yeah, it really is crazy, isn't it? And, now, and their uh, benefit what, is now they get to buy into outer space. Bill Gates, another guy that sold out. Um, Billy, Billy resisted the government. They came in. They were going to take him to the cleaners, and, and he folded like an old suit. Now he's able to buy his own telescope, government funded, 90% funded in South America. Uh, gee, wow. I would like to do that, too. Yeah, funded by the government. But, by the way, these people that get these too big to fail banks that own them, uh, what happens is they're getting free government money and they're speculating in the food market. At the same time, they're exploring space. One of the things that I've stated to uh, 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 Dr. David Steenblock, who's one of the top in the world uh, stem cell doctors, he's actually one of my docs as well, and um, that you can't do space exploration without understanding what aging is and human life and the necessary uh, presence of the human resonance frequency and other forces that allow us to actually express our genetics. And, of course, uh, organizations like SpaceX and these other organizations are being taken over by private corporations and have been for decades uh, build underground cities, operable space platforms, et cetera. They're doing this because they want to control the future. They want to not tell the public about a danger that might cause worldwide famine or the fact of danger of using abiotic fuels, which is what they are. Their abiotic fuels are not created by dinosaurs and birds. They don't want to tell you that if they just industrialize China, India, and Indonesia, the world oxygen level will drop to an abysmally dangerously low level. They don't want to tell you that we need to move to tokamak fusion reactors, even though they've had them for 50-plus years, and we've altered the energy sources like geothermal and energy from the vacuum because they want to control basically energy as the currency of the future and also the other side of that currency is literally life extension. So life extension technology, the energy control, the control of information is the currency that these 
they've done by bifurcating civilization. So what would you say to people that, that think this is the theory? This is, of course, the same predator class that ran the ancient world, that ran the Middle Ages, that ran all the royals. These same predator class are running our world today, aren't they? Uh, yeah, and uh, the one thing I always say that the, the one thing people in charge, people get to this level of control and uh, obscurity, the one thing they know is that it's essential to keep the public stupid about science. Uh, that's why in the Middle Ages the public thought that the world was flat. Uh, that was, it was taught to them so they wouldn't get out of their mental cage. Now we have the 4.5 billion year old solar system that will never change, never has changed as the standard theory, uh, that comets are dirty snowballs, that they will do nothing to Earth, they never have done anything, they never will do anything. Um, the uh, electrically neutral uh, solar system, uh, which is all of these are completely 180 degrees wrong. But that's what's taught to the public. That's what's in the textbooks, all the way to Ph.D. level astrophysics and astronomy. Why is this being pushed? Well, because they've got to keep the public stupid. If the public were intelligent, they would realize that we can get energy from other sources. We don't need oil and coal. <clears throat> we don't need to rely on, uh, you know, the Mideastern wars that have been going on since the, you know, 1930s, really, uh, over oil uh, in this international control of oil is ridiculous. It's not necessary, never was. Um, you know, the, the banking industry, the, now they're going to control water. That's uh, one thing I want people to watch my current work dealing with uh, uh, trying to analyze the world control of water. Now banks... For example, in Canada, the, there are banks, private banks, that are doing uh, studies, popular, or, or they're doing analysis of public opinion in Canada on water issues through banks. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> a well, lot of people, control is on the way. Well, when people in Pickens bought all the land to set up his uh, windmill system across the Midwest United States, it just turns out that all the land set on the middle of the central portion of the Ogallala Aquifer. And so mm -hmm. yeah. these globalists, they want to control water in the future. They also want to literally, uh, the carbon taxes, most people aren't aware that recently Obama, with all the scandals that are going on, put in a policy that's put in place, and then he rules by fiat and by edict and by policy rather than even by law. He really, does, it, it, you know, even this Gang of Eight bill for immigration is a, Smokescreen for a national biometric ID for all Americans. And when they say that they have this guy Snowden uh, releasing information about uh, uh, the National Security Agency, they've been doing it for a third of a century. This is nothing new. This is all allowed. Yeah. You will then be in a state of fear that the government controls everything. But we just need to disconnect from this system and, we'll be, and we will get control. We need to start asking questions and we'll learn real science by like going to your website and listening to your show. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Professor McCanny. Thank you for listening, everybody. Back in hour two and hour three, I'll be discussing all the D to A nutriment line and the discussion with uh, Brian on our latest nutraceuticals. We now have the IC2 enzyme, the box carbohydrates. We'll be releasing that with a new nutriment name here in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, back tomorrow with Harley Swanger. You don't want to miss it. Live shows tomorrow.